Hello? I think we're live. <laughs> hello. Uh, hello and welcome to the This Is Not Therapy Hour. I am Brandon Tessers. I'm a licensed therapist, uh, but this is not therapy for so many reasons. And I am having a technical issue with the stream today, so it looks like it's not broadcasting on Facebook. And I don't know why I'm saying that because anybody who's trying to get to the stream from Facebook wouldn't be able to hear it. And anybody who's hearing it isn't trying to get to the stream through Facebook. But that was my confusion there at the beginning when we just launched the stream. Um, quick overview at the top of what we're doing here. Every week, every Wednesday from 1 to 2 p.m. Central Time, we do this streaming that this is not therapy hour, which, you know, I came up with as a placeholder name when we first were putting this idea around, you know, batting it around. Um, but we liked it, so we kept it. And it's just an open conversation. It's a QA, and a it's whatever. Those of you who are here watching, great. Thank you for being here. Those of you who are here watching and are in the chat, whatever you put in the chat, that shapes the conversation, just as with all conversations, all interpersonal communication of any kind. So I'll start by talking about some stuff just because, you know, who wants dead air? Uh, but really, we're here to talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. You just got to let me know about it. Ask me, tell me, prompt me, whatever. Uh, or if what we start by talking about is interesting, engage in the conversation that way. So thank you for being here. Talk as much as you like, as much as you can. I appreciate it all. Otherwise, it's me just ranting for an hour, which, you know, I don't hate, but it's probably not as beneficial or entertaining for other people. I think that mostly covers it. Oh, I guess I should say, because I always forget that I run a practice called Effective Artistry that is a therapy and coaching practice. We specialize in neurodiversity, executive functioning, and creativity. Creativity, not necessarily artistry, you know, being an artist, but creativity as the cognitive um, process that, that touches on everything that we do. So, welcome. And today I did not think about a topic in advance, but of course I always have a million different things on my mind. And today, the thing that is on my mind actually wasn't on my mind before I took that sip of tea. It just popped into my head. But yeah, let's talk about this instead. Communication. Um, oh, sorry, that was the technical glitch telling me that I am not live on Facebook. Hopefully it doesn't keep doing that. Um, communication is an interesting process. Uh, because it's really very like messy and imperfect and it has to be by the very nature of it, right? That what we're doing when we're communicating with one another is we're doing things, including saying words or whatever things that we're doing. We're, we're engaging in some kind of observable behavior that we're hoping impacts the other person. We're hoping that they notice it. We're hoping that whatever element of it that they notice is all the important stuff and that they translate it in the way and it interprets and that it affects them. It's a real guessing game, but we don't really explore it that much, honestly, typically in our culture. Obviously, hopefully, theoretically, people who are in therapy and coaching processes and those things will, will do more exploration of it. But this idea of miscommunication um, as being attributable to something that one person or another involved in the communication did, did incorrectly, did deliberately, is a really harmful one. So I'm going to talk through the way that we like to talk about, I like to talk about communication that I find to be helpful. And as always, I'll say the same thing I usually say, which is everything we put out there is not in opposition to anything else, unless it is intrinsically in opposition to the, the meaning of something else. But we're not looking to replace or take away anything that other people find useful or helpful. We're just looking to add more options that whatever works, whatever way of conceptualizing something, engaging with something, navigate, whatever works, it works. Well, what we care about is utility, not some theoretical idea of what thing is more correct, which how could we even know? So there's just one possibility it might be helpful, it might not. I find it helpful a lot. I talk about communication as a four step process, four stages to that. So first, those of you who have been here before, you know this about me. Anybody who maybe doesn't know this, I'll just say quickly, I am obsessed with words. I'm obsessed with language, with semiotic, semiology, signs and signified and all those things for a lot of reasons. Uh, 
So I got to define my terms because what do we mean by communication, right? So when I'm talking about communication, communication to me is anything that one person intentionally does in order to impact the experience of another person to change the way that they're thinking, change the way that they're feeling or change the way that they're behaving or some combination of those things. And that doesn't mean that it's manipulative. This is all communication. If I'm saying, hey, nice to meet you, then all I'm trying to impact in your experience is to draw your attention and awareness to the fact that I'm here or that I'm pleasant or safe or you know that I intend for us to talk more or whatever kind of a thing. Uh, because there's a there's a kind of phrase out there, especially in the therapy world of all behavior is communication, which I think is a valuable one, give it, you know, depending on how you interpret it. I think that's a valuable phrase if what we're saying is all behavior is meaningful, right? That everything anyone does, they do it for a reason. But not everything is intended to be communication. Some things I do just for myself, even though there's a reason for it and you might be able to observe it and read into it some kind of important understanding, make some connections. I'm not doing it for that reason. So that's how I interpret that phrase, just in case anybody's heard it. I think it's useful in that way. Otherwise, I don't think it's useful just because if all behavior is communication, then what's the point of the word communication? We would just say behavior, right? Um, so communication is when I or some person, the speaker, we're going to call it. And um, I should probably, as soon as I said that out loud, I realized I should probably come up with a better term to use than that when we're talking about this model, because not all communication is spoken. Not everybody speaks at all. So um, I'll have to think about that as we go along. Actually, if any of you in the chat have good ideas, because of course we could say the, the communicator, the initiator, I don't know. I'll use those, those wonky kind of unwieldy terms um, for now. You know what? Here's what we'll do. I'm going to use A and B. No, that's bad because if somebody joins into the stream in the middle of it, they might not realize what we're talking about. So I'll talk about the person who is um, delivering the communication and the person who's receiving the communication. There we go. Um, so if I am attempting to deliver some communication, that still doesn't sound right. If I'm attempting to initiate some communication, convey, well, we'll keep playing with it. Uh, if I'm attempting to communicate with you, right, this is a, a four stage process that first there's my intention, my conscious intention of what impact I am trying to have on you, whether that's a concept that I want you to be able to understand and internalize for some reason, whether that's a request for help, whether that's getting you to stop doing something, making you feel better, whatever. I have an intention consciously of what I'm trying to accomplish. That's the first step. The second then is what I do, the behavior that is observed by you, observable by you and by others uh, outside of my head in order to try and have that impact. Well, this is a good question. Let me finish this framework real quick and then I will come to this question. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to have an impact on you. Then I do some sort of behavior and that behavior some of it I am consciously of, some of it I'm aware of. I might choose some of my words, I might choose some of my volume or pitch or nonverbal language or whatever. Um, some of it I'm not. So that's the third step is what do you notice? What do you perceive and observe? Because you're not gonna perceive everything. It's gonna be a subset of things. So there are some things that I might think that you're or intending for you to notice that you don't. And there are also probably a lot of things that you are noticing that figure into the context for you that I didn't intend for or I'm not aware of. Some of those things even are things that I'm doing that I'm not aware of. Some of them are things, connotations of previous experiences of yours that I might not even have had the opportunity to know. So that's the third is what you're observing. And then the fourth is how you interpret what you're observing. You take that uh, sorry, there's that Facebook glitch again. You take that observation and then unpack it. The point of semiology, of language, of signs and signified is that we are taking something which is inherently not connected to something else, but creating a connection there. The sounds that I make when I say the word fire have no inherent connection 
to the concept of what a fire is or what fire is. But because we have kind of a mutually agreed upon experience of connecting that set, set of sounds to that concept, it's linked. And so by making that set of sounds, theoretically, I can pull that concept up into your awareness. But how exactly it's connected is impossible for me to know. So I have an intention, I do a thing, you observe something, you interpret it. My intention and your interpretation will never be exactly the same thing. They can't be. If I say fire, even if we both speak English and know what that word means and hear it you know, in its fullest extent, we're not thinking of the exact same thing as different connotations. Even if I try to be very specific about remember that fire you and I were at last night, you are going to remember different things. You perceived different things in that moment to even remember, et cetera. So the goal is not to have perfect fidelity that you understand, interpret exactly what I'm trying to get across. The point is for us to be close enough that it doesn't cause a problem, which is for the most part what we do. The downside of this process, and it's not something that we can avoid, we can try and make it less frequent, but you can't eliminate it completely, is that sometimes we're not close enough to avoid causing a problem. Sometimes we miscommunicate in a way that causes a problem and we can't know when that's gonna be. If we had known it would cause a problem, we would have communicated more or differently or more specifically. So we have to, we have to be ready for those things to happen and then how we respond to them is what matters. And what, what I am putting out there, and I'll just finish this real quick and then get into the chat because I, I appreciate you putting things in chat, uh, is that if, if we miscommunicate in a way that causes a problem, that's not your fault and it's not my fault. That each of us have a valid interpretation of whatever the communication, the observable behavior was. That you are correct in your interpretation in that if somebody else, or even if I in a different context had done and said exactly those things, it could validly be interpreted the way that you're interpreting it. And I'm not incorrect in that somebody else or you in a different context could have interpreted everything I did in the same way that I intended it for it to be interpreted. So I didn't misspeak, you didn't misunderstand, we just miscommunicated. And we can't even really know why that happens, although of course, once we notice it, we can talk more about it. So that piece that it's faultless, it's not I'm wrong or you're wrong, we both interpreted it correctly, but it allows us to correct for it. We only would call it a miscommunication because it caused a problem. We have to resolve the problem. Either I can try and blame you or you can try and blame me. Even if we both agree, oh no, that's my fault. Well, we still have to resolve the problem. So I still need to try again to communicate to you whatever it was that I was trying to communicate to you in the first place. So I just think that's a helpful way to approach it because when somebody says, oh, I see how you that came across, but that's not what I meant. Sometimes we have a default reaction to say like, no, no, I heard what you said or vice versa. You know, when, when somebody is saying, no, no, I said it very clearly and specifically this way, you completely misunderstood me. Well, not super helpful either because that doesn't resolve the miscommunication. There was something missing. We have to find what it was, something we missed and, and repair it. And that gets really hard to do if we're fighting over whose fault it is. But it becomes a lot easier to do if we just say, wait a second, something went wrong there. Let's reinvestigate, uh, investigate this together. I was trying to rush through that so I could finish it and not leave it hanging, but get over here. Uh, let me. Oh, it's about what we're talking about. I didn't even realize. I talked with a friend about that a bit when it comes to graphic t-shirts. He hates them because he sees them like an advertising banner, which I understand. But sometimes it makes me, it just makes me feel a little nice to wear something associated with something I like. Yeah. So in this particular case, this isn't, uh, this is an example of miscommunication, meaning that what you are doing, what you're attempting to do in wearing the, the graphic t-shirt, your reasoning behind it, and then how somebody else, in this case, your friend interprets that are two different things. You are doing it because it, you know, like you said, it's nice to wear something associated with something I like. I just like being reminded, having a visual or a tactile understanding or uh, not understanding, but um, sensory input that draws my attention back to this thing I like throughout the day. And the friend is not wrong either. He used the pronoun he there. Uh, he's not wrong either because, yeah, if you're walking around wearing a logo of a brand, then, yeah, you're 
potentially bringing more awareness to that brand. That's what advertising is. And of course, there's a million other reasons too, right? Maybe I just wore it because it was the only clean shirt that I had, or maybe I wore it because I, me personally, Brandon, I uh, worked at Blockbuster, which, you know, reveals a little bit about how old I am, I suppose, when I was 17 or 18 years old. And they would give us t-shirts that had a, whatever big release was coming to home video or DVD or whatever on it as the things were being released. And I wore, wore those shirts for a long time just because I don't like spending money. I didn't even like the things. I, I had one that had a Lemony Snicket uh, logo or something on it, which is not like I hated that movie, but I don't care about it. I just like a free shirt that fit I have to spend money on. But this is why communication is great, because then when we have those misunderstandings, we can explain, like you just did in that comment right there, right? Oh, I can see why you might think that, but let me clarify, this is my experience of it. And again, that's great, that's easier if we are open to the idea that we don't perfectly understand or interpret other people, that my interpretation can be valid and different from what you meant. My intent can be valid and different than what you meant. I'll say part of the graphic tea thing or a lot of things in this category, I kind of often think of it as a, a form of self-advertising is kind of the way I think of it as a little bit of both of what you're saying, that it is you're broadcasting to other people around you, this is something I like. So it's you're wearing something that you like, but also with the intention of displaying or not the intention necessarily, but the impact of displaying to other people that you like it, which means if you walk around wearing a graphic tee for something that I love, I might see it and say, hey, let's talk. You know, we got some things in common. And the more like, mm, what's the word I'm looking for? The less common that interest is, the more likely other people who share that interest with you are to comment on it. Right. If if I walk around wearing, I don't know, a Star Wars T-shirt, lots of people like Star Wars. So you get some comments maybe here and there. But if I walk around wearing a Dungeons and Dragons t-shirt, which also is very popular, don't get me wrong, uh, but not as much as Star Wars, I'm more likely for someone else who also enjoys Dungeons and Dragons to comment on it. Be it real specific, you know, it's the whole like, oh, you guys probably haven't heard of this band kind of thing. If you name something really kind of esoteric or unknown, and then the other person also knows and likes it, instant connection usually. Uh, I had a friend who always insisted that she understood that what I was saying and that I was just overcomplicating things by trying to continue to explain, ooh, that is a good thing, uh, a good thing for us to talk about. And she got angry with me over things she was misunderstanding. <laughs> like wearing shirts with subtle polyhedral so I can draw out all the secret nerds. Polyhedral is like the different funny shape Dungeons and Dragons dice. Um, yeah, so here's another piece of that that communication thing. The point is, as with most everything that we do, that our brain is making a determination about what is the minimum necessary expenditure of resources in order to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. So if I'm the one initiating the communication, what is the minimum I need to do, the minimum behavior, the minimum energy, the minimum time I need to expend in order to try and get that across to you? And if I'm the one that's listening, receiving the communication, then what is the minimum I need to pay attention, the minimum I need to hear, see, feel, whatever the communication is in order to understand what you're putting across to me. The brain is a cognitive miser. It does not spend resources unless it has a reason to do so. So something that is, I was gonna say very common, but it honestly, it's more useful to just think of it as pretty much universal because it pretty much is, is that we do not, hear everything that another person says. We do not see everything that another person does. We don't come anywhere close. And just to be clear, a lot of this conversation is going to be focused around the most common um, uh, formats of communication. So we're gonna talk a lot about speaking and listening and, and seeing and you know making or generating or giving signs or nonverbal communication. But again, communication can be a lot more than that. Right. If I if I make breakfast for my wife before she wakes up and leave it on the table and then I'm gone, that's still communication. It's something I did with the intention of impacting her experience. Right. Um, 
so I'll, I'll try and be clear about that, but I probably will say, speak, or hear, or listen quite a bit, and just know that that does not cover it all. <laughs> um, just laughing at another comment. Totally lost track of what I was saying. Oh, right. So I am not going to hear everything that you're saying. You're not going to hear everything that I'm saying. And something that is very interesting to me that seems counterintuitive, the better that you know somebody, the more experience you have, or the better your ability to take small pieces of data and extend that out into larger conclusions. Um, a lot of times we consider that to be a part of intelligence, although those of you who have been here before know that I have some very specific thoughts about how that stuff is conceptualized. Um, that, I totally lost my train of thought again there. Talking about hearing, oh, that, that the more we have, the more we know about a thing, about a person, the less we pay attention, which seems the opposite of what the experience is, right? Because what I'm talking about is to a specific instance of communication. The people I know the best, you know, my, my immediate family, my wife and my three children, I pay attention to them all the time, constantly. But in a given instance of communication, a given thing that they say to me or that I say to them, my brain is more likely to say like, oh, they use, you know, they said 20 words, but these three words are the only ones that we really need in order to understand because we have enough knowledge about them and the context that we don't need to listen to it all. That oftentimes the people who are more intelligent are listening and paying attention to things less just generally, but especially communication. Oftentimes people who care the most about hearing and understanding what you are trying to communicate to them are the ones who will miss it the most because they're, they're not focused in, their brain won't focus in on every specific single little thing unless and until they have reason to. And that's miscommunication. If we engage with it in that faultless way, if instead of saying, no, 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 I got what you mean. Don't try to overcomplicate it or don't try to over explain it or take it back or whatever kind of a thing. Of course, sometimes people do that. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying that it's never happened that someone realized that what they said got a different reaction than they thought and then they pretended that it was something different. It happens. But generally that's still, even in those cases where it's true, where it's accurate, it's still not usually a very productive or useful way to move forward. Because if they're doing it deliberately, why wouldn't they just continue to maintain that, that it was what they're saying that it is? Unless you give them some reason, some safety in being able to reveal what, what happened. Whatever reason that person is doing that, it's because they are, I don't know what word you want to use, some negative emotion. They are displeased, anxious, nervous, upset, sad, angry, whatever, about the impact that it had. That's not what they wanted. And so they're trying to change it. Even if the message was relatively accurately interpreted, they didn't realize what reaction it would elicit. And that wasn't the impact that they were trying to have on you. Otherwise, they wouldn't be walking it back, theoretically, anyway. Um, so yeah, we don't pay that close of attention until a miscommunication happens that then calls our attention back to it. And now we sit down and say, okay, my brain now has reason to believe that it's worth paying closer attention than I did the first time and hearing more specifically what you're saying, seeing more specifically what you're doing. So let's get into it. Of course, if instead we go that other way, like we mentioned at the beginning, a more common way of saying, no, you got it wrong or I got it wrong, then we don't. If what we're saying is, no, you misinterpreted it, then what we're doing is we're defending the amount of attention or time or whatever that we put into it. I paid close enough attention to understand, don't tell me I'm wrong. You got it wrong. You got to spend more of your resources reevaluating, reinvestigating, reinterpreting that instance of communication between us. I don't need to. And again, it's not like, it's not that that's never true or never useful. That can be useful that one person does the work of reevaluating it and coming to that conclusion. It's just less likely to be successful and less likely to make your relationship better over the long term. Of course, a lot of the time we don't care about making the relationship better. There's, you know, somebody that I don't like, my boss or whatever, who's a jerk and I don't give a crap about. I do care about how he or she perceives me. 
So I want to be clear about that, but I don't care about whether, you know, we have a loving relationship moving forward or whatever. I feel like I risk overheating if I try to analyze every intonation of a stranger talking, but with friends, I'm comfortable enough that I can pay more attention to the details. Yeah, well, I love that. It's framed paradoxically, but it's what we're talking about here, right? That when talking with a stranger, we're going to oversimplify, but not in a way that makes it inaccurate. With a stranger, you feel less safe, more vulnerable. So there's vigilance involved. You got to be more careful. Like right now, I'm being more careful about what I'm saying and how I'm saying it than I would in a normal conversation because I don't know who's watching this and I don't know how my how I might impact them. So I'm trying to be very careful to, in all the instances that I can be aware of, and I can't be aware of them all, to try to do everything I can so that I don't unintentionally cause harm to anybody and so that I do maximize the benefit that I can give for anybody, random people you know, figments of my imagination, right? Not without foundation in like reality or experience or whatever, but I'm just imagining what somebody might perceive. So I put a lot of effort into it and I'll still miss every, or I'll still miss things, things that I can't have anticipated might cause somebody harm, which, you know, being aware of that is real crappy. <laughs> I don't like it. And honestly, a lot of us get stuck in that where it's like, well, then I just won't do anything at all. You know, if we realize that we are incapable of having perfect understanding between two people, that we know that we must inevitably at least sometimes miscommunicate in ways that cause problem or harm somebody, that sometimes we just kind of freeze and opt out. Well, rather than try anything, I just won't, because that way I won't accidentally harm anyone. Except the problem is that that's futile too, because not communicating also might cause harm for somebody. So you're trapped. It's not my point. Uh, sorry, that was a little bit facetious, but it's true. We are trapped. You just got to go forward anyway. Things that are useful are also limited. We can't predict the future and it's not perfect, but we do our best to come up with our best ideas and try. And then like we're talking about, when we find out that we're wrong, we're open to the feedback. We take the new information and we adjust to the best of our ability going forward. So when talking with a stranger, analyzing every intonation, yeah. A, you are more incentivized. Your brain has more reason to pay closer attention because you don't know this person and you don't know what they might do. So you can't just relax and be safe. And you don't know this person. You don't know their context. You don't know their story or their language. You don't have experience with them. So it is harder for you to be able to theoretically accurately understand or interpret what it is that they're trying to put across to you. So if you go into that interaction with that goal, I need to understand what they're saying. It will be very overwhelming because you won't. You won't understand it exactly. And you're a lot more likely to misunderstand, you know, some piece of it, miss some piece of it that they were intending. Uh, you know, interpret it differently than what they were intending for it, than they're interpreting it. Whereas with your friends, you're safe. You don't have to put all that effort into being vigilant theoretically, right? That's why you would consider them to be friends. And you have a lot more information about them. So in the first case, you're paying a lot more attention. In the second case, you're paying a lot less attention. Paying more attention to the details, if that's happening around your friends, then what that means is, again, in theory, I don't know the specifics of the interactions, but what that means is that a lot of it, most of it, you know, whatever of the communication requires very little to no attention from you. So whatever attention you are paying can be paid to the specific subtle nuances because all that rest of it, yeah, yeah, I get it. We're on the same page there. There's actually a very interesting um, psychological phenomenon where if you put a group of people together who agree about a topic and then ask them to discuss the topic, over time that entire group becomes more um, extreme in their opinion on that topic. because. Whether, you know, we can attribute motive to it that people are trying to differentiate or whatever. But if we generally agree about a thing, well, then we can discuss the tiny little distinctions and nuances and differences because we don't have to waste time discussing the like broad parts of it that we already understand that we all agree upon. But as we get further into the nuance and explore it further and somebody makes a point and, you know, and of course, there is a natural urge for all of us at times to say like, well, well, sure, you guys, we agree, but 
but I, you know, know it even more intensely or deeply than you guys do. And we kind of pull in that way. But yeah, that's why it's nice to have, no, that's one of the things that is nice about having friendships, long-term relationships, loving, safe relationships, is that we construct a language together. So we can speak that language more easily. We see this in, in games like, um, oh, I don't know, charades or a lot of party games, right? Taboo, things like that, where well, the whole point of the game is literally just you're trying to communicate what you would normally use in order to communicate to that person. Can you still get it correctly? These are literally like communication training games. And you, we all who have had this experience, which I would say is a lot of us, uh, we all know the difference between two partners who know each other very well and have a lot of experience. This is in pop culture a lot and shows and things where people will be like, oh, that thing we got last year in Venice. Oh, right, watermelon, right, or whatever thing it is that would make no sense to anybody outside of those two people with that shared experience that shared language together i spend a decent amount of time trying to make sure my words are what i want in anonymous forums while with friends i can sling words more casually and mitigate risk with emojis for tone yes yeah again a lot of what we're talking about and brings in another good point that so literalism or even hyperliteralism, where people will focus entirely or disproportionately on the established like dictionary definitions for the words that a person is using. And oftentimes people will, you know, like you in the chat, I'm very similar. Obviously, I'm talking about how clear and specific I'm trying to be with my words. We're putting a lot of effort in because we want to be careful about having the impact we're trying to have or avoiding, you know, a specific harmful impact or whatever thing that we're trying to avoid. And when it happens anyway, there is oftentimes a reaction to say, no, I was very specific and clear. I said exactly what I meant, which, of course, is true. And their interpretation is still valid. So part of that we can talk about in terms of attention over time. I was going to say hypnosis. Maybe we'll still talk about that term. Uh, when you read a book, when you watch it, when you watch a new show or a YouTube video, right? That first three seconds of the video needs to give you reason, give your brain reason to continue to pay attention to the next three seconds or divide it up by seconds or lines in a book or however, right? That first small portion needs to prove that there is value to your brain in continuing to pay attention to the next portion. And that's always true. So it has to either deliver value or give you reason to believe that even though it itself is not valuable, it's setting up something for value later. A lot of this is like, you know, thumbnails that give, you know, a hint of like, oh, that seems interesting that I'm going to pay attention, right? Or people will talk about in books how important the opening line is. Well, the further you get in, the less important it is that each portion is as appealing, right? In other words, like in advertising or, you know, whatever things, I want that opening thing to be probably more general, like catch more people so it won't be as specific. And I want it to be impactful and give you reason to keep looking. The second line, I need to be worth reading the third line and so on and so forth. But by the time we get to like, the 7,000th line, if that one's not so great, well, there was enough value delivered in the previous 6,999 to make it so that you're going to still go on to line 7,001, right? So that's, it's a thing that we all do all the time. Of course, some of us, especially artists and writers and things like that, but also teachers and, and really anybody who's trying to communicate quite a bit it's worth being conceptually aware of, right? That, that we want to be more clear and careful and specific and broad and tantalizing early. And then later on, <laughs> I said specific and broad, didn't I? I don't remember, but I might have. Uh, we want to be more impactful or tantalizing or whatever early. Later on, we can get more specific because what we talked about in the past general things apply more frequently. They apply in more cases. Something that's general is going to grab more people. 
but conversely, it is less impactful in each case to which it applies. It must be because it is more general. It can't carry the same specific detailed information or impact. And specific, obviously, is less frequently applicable, but when it is applicable, it's more likely to have a more intense impact. So I want to do less impactful, more general things early. And then as we get in is when I get more specific. And if it misses for you, well, that's okay because it hits for this person and you'll still go on to the next thing anyway. And I just want to make sure that there's something in there that hits for you too. Honestly, even the way that I'm talking quickly right now is an example of all this. Yeah, the way social media platforms are designed for that kind of continuous entertainment poll. Yeah, we're trying to give your brain reason to pay attention. And you know what's interesting about social media, or I see you talking about slot machines there, uh, the, the Skinner box, I don't know if that's part of what you're referring to, right? <laughs> the contradiction of my words is enticing. Actually, that's a specific hypnotic technique. Uh, not that I was doing on purpose, though. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, so B.F. Skinner was a behavioral researcher, a behaviorist researcher. And the Skinner box that's referred to constantly was a particular design experiment with a rat in a box that pushed a button or a lever, I forget the exact details, and then in different iterations of the experiment or of the trial would deliver a reward at some kind of interval, right? So they did it with every time you push it, you get a reward. They did it with every three times, every six times they did it. And what they ended up finding is if you get it on any kind of a predictable schedule, then you don't press the lever except for when you need it, right? Even if it is, you know, you have to press it 50 times to get it, well, you can establish and learn that pattern. So, and of course, these are all about rats and there's lots, lots that we could talk about in terms of the limitations of the utility of these kinds of experiments, partly because it's on rats and not humans, but for a lot of reasons. Well, what that research found is that if I make it a variable interval, unpredictable, that sometimes you press it and you get one right away. Sometimes you have to press it three times before you get one, sometimes 10, Sometimes it's one and one and one and then seven and then one and one and then two, whatever. If I make it sufficiently random, not perfectly random, a math friend of mine would, would uh, be clear about the distinction probably. But if I make it sufficiently random that you are unable to learn and predict the pattern, then what happens is the rats just keep pushing the lever forever. They can have all they need of the food, of the reward. They're going to keep pushing it. Because there is a sense, theoretically, this is the hypothesis, there's a sense there that I don't know when this might stop, right? That I have to get it while I can. And this translates, this theory translates in useful ways, theoretically, on uh, all kinds of things. Like, for example, if you were raised in an environment in which, for reasons that theoretically exist, but we're beyond your observation. And so you don't know them and can't put together some kind of predictable thing. So it seemed random. If your parents randomly made you do chores, you know, then probably you didn't do chores unless your parents were making you do it. Because why? Why would I do a chore right now when it, they're forcing me to do chores is a random thing. If I did it right now, they might just force me to do it later anyway. So why would I do it? I'll just wait, right? Evaluation of failed replication of classic foundational psychological studies. Ooh, okay. I'm. You had a question about hypnosis up there, and we could talk about that. But like I said, we follow wherever. If you want to talk about reevaluation of failed replication, <laughs> uh, for anyone who doesn't know, there's something people refer to as a replication crisis. So the idea in in research is that any experiment theoretically should be able to be replicated by somebody else in some other context. Like one of the foundational ideas behind science is the concept of empiricism. <laughs> Not a challenge, just something I'm very interested in actually and really like talking about because the truth is that a lot, a lot of what we are all struggling with kind of collectively originates in some really badly done and badly communicated experiments that have never been replicated but also haven't been challenged so yeah i'm happy to talk about it if, if that is what we want to talk about um so empiricism means observable in a way that is consistent from person to person for lack of a better you know simply right 
um, that if I look and say, well, that is red, and then you also independently of me look and say that is red, then we call that an empirical fact, right? So in scientific experimentation and research, which is different from science, but in research, the idea behind scientific research is that I run an experiment and I share my results with everybody. And I also share the very detailed instructions about how I ran my experiment, because no matter what my results are, I cannot say anything about what it means unless somebody else somewhere else independent of me in a different context runs the same experiment and gets the same results and we call that replication you have to replicate the experiment because otherwise there are so so many variables that impact everything that what we're trying to do in scientific research is isolate those variables we try to control as much as possible and then identify a specific independent variable that we switch and then measure the dependent variable, which we are theorizing our hypothesis is that if we modify the independent variable, the dependent variable will also be modified in some kind of way that correlates. But we can't know that. Even if it's replicated, we can't know that. But the more something that is replicated, the more confident we can become that other random variables that we didn't anticipate and couldn't control for wasn't what happened. So as a ridiculous example, theoretically, I could design and run an experiment with such detail that you can run the exact same experiment, except what are some things that we can't control for? If nothing else, is a different day. It's a different time. It's a different part of the world, different weather, different, right? We can't control for everything. So by replicating, that's a way of being able to kind of increase our confidence that those things which we cannot control don't seem to be as impactful here because we're getting the same results the replication crisis which is particularly bad in psychology but it is a problem in pretty much all science for all kinds of reasons that i would rant about involving academia um, means that nobody is replicating these studies well huh, i will rant a little bit about it there is no incentive for somebody to replicate a study that if you are an academic, if you are a psychologist and you are trying to forward your career, there's really not a lot of advantage to you into just redoing, replicating somebody else's study, unless you are some level of confident that in your attempt to replicate it, you'll actually disprove it because that is beneficial to your career. But there's the first person that comes out and says, hey, look at this thing we've discovered can get a lot of attention or money or rewarded by their university or whatever. And then the second person who says, yeah, we ran that, too, and it looks like it was correct, doesn't get much out of it. So none of these studies are being replicated. And especially in psychology, that, that crisis is worse and more impactful. Theoretically, yeah, that's the one I was just going to talk about. Theoretically, let's say I wanted to give a bunch of children marshmallows and then use it to prove whether those children will live, live successful and fulfilling lives in 20 years. So that is a great example. That's the one I was just about to launch into. It's called the marshmallow test. Uh, it was an experiment run. I'm going to get some of these details wrong, probably, but I want to say it was in 1973, something like that. Uh, and a lot of people have heard about it in some version. The basics of it is you sit a child, I want to say they were four years old and six years old, but again, could be getting details wrong. You sit a child down and there's a marshmallow in front of them. And you say to them, hey, you can have this marshmallow if you want, or if you're willing to wait for a few minutes while I go and get the bag, when I come back, I'll give you two marshmallows. So either have this one now, or if you wait for a little bit, I'll give you two. Because the hypothesis here, somebody was, I wish I could remember the name of the experimenter. I'm blanking on it. But the hypothesis was delayed gratification. How many of us have heard that phrase, delayed gratification? It's been talked about as though it's just simply, purely a true thing that impacts us all. That was the hypothesis that theoretically, if someone is able to delay gratification, which is a concept like kind of named by this experimenter, the theory was if they can delay gratification, they'll be more successful. So going into the experiment, the experimenter had the idea, I think a part of success, a part of what makes someone successful, ah, 1972, I was off by a year, uh, at Stanford, by the way, we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> uh, 
uh, this person went into it thinking, okay, I think part of what makes people successful is the ability to delay gratification, to identify something that they want, but to put off getting that thing, right? Already, we've got a lot of problems there because if I am putting off getting something, well, theoretically, there would be a reason for that, right? And that reason would shift based on whatever the thing is and why I'm putting it off and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, so he runs the experiment. And it was a what we call a longitudinal experiment, which means that it followed the study participants over quite some time, you know, over multiple decades. And so they run the experiment. They record which kids waited for the two marshmallows in you know, delayed gratification and which kids had the one marshmallow and then track them across a bunch of metrics over the course of their life to put together an index of success, basically. And then map, does it seem to be true that the kids that waited for the two marshmallows are generally more successful than the kids that had the one marshmallow? And the results came back saying, yes, it does look like that seems to be the case. But again, you might already be identifying a bunch of the problems here for one. How specifically are we measuring success? What are we using as our metrics to be able to construct this idea of successful life? And of course, they explain it all in quite great detail. It's not that it's unclear, it's that it's debatable what we would consider to be success. But even beyond that, how are we sure that delayed gratification, which is a construct, a concept that we made up, how are we sure that that is the determining factor and we're supposed to replicate it but nobody did because there's no incentive to until something like 2007, 2008, 2009, somewhere around there, somebody finally went back. And again, only because they thought the initial experiment was flawed and it was, they replicated the experiment and found that of course it was a bunch of nonsense. There's all, all kinds of problems with that initial experiment. For one, every single um, participant in the study was pulled from the Stanford daycare center. So every single one of them, and I might be confusing this with the year, but I want to say there were only 72 participants in the study, something like that. So a relatively small sample size. I could be getting that completely mixed up with the year. Uh, that every single one of them was at the Stanford daycare, which means that their parents were probably either Stanford professors or Stanford students, and that means things, or staff at Stanford, and that means things. They didn't look at socioeconomic status of the parents. They didn't look at race. They didn't, you know, they considered those irrelevant, right? Well, what are some other things, theoretically, because we can't prove this either, right? Although this replication that disproved, quote unquote, disproved the initial one, obviously did some studies that provide evidence to support their theories of what's going on. What are some theoretical things that might make it more likely for a child to wait for two marshmallows as opposed to one that also plays into whatever factors we're looking at in determining whether they are successful? Yeah, in the chat there, how hungry was the child? Sure. Were they already sick of marshmallows? Yeah. Here are some others. Do they generally have an experience of adults that adults can be trusted to deliver on promises? Do they generally have an experience of, if I don't take advantage of this thing that is here in front of me right now, that's okay because I will definitely have another opportunity for it later? According to Wikipedia, oh, please. 32 children, way less than I thought. But yes, all from Stanford's nursery school. Uh, <laughs> yeah, all kinds of problems. And that's fine. That's what science is. That's what research is. We we come up with a hypothesis. We test it in order to gather. We design an experiment or a study or whatever to gather evidence to support or negate that theory. No, you know, every researcher, every scientist would be very clear about the fact that we can never prove anything affirmatively, only negatively. I can't prove that, you know, gravity is always a constant, even though we have so much evidence to suggest that it that it more or less is that we would consider it to be one. It's not very practical or useful to, to throw in the caveat every time of like, as far as we know, but that is there, right? Gravity could theoretically shift tomorrow. We can't prove that it won't, but we can disprove things. If you're gonna say gravity is a constant, I can, all I need is one instance where it changed to disprove that theory. 
So we can't prove, but we want to work towards these things anyway, but they're not being replicated. And in the meantime, how much of our society was built around this idea that delaying gratification is in some way beneficial, where we have no evidence to actually suggest that that's the case. How much of not only intentional design in terms of our academics, in terms of our occupational settings, right? Occupational practices and educational practices, parenting practices, how much of this is based around an idea that it is somehow inherently better to be able to hold off on your gratification until later? Not even, by the way, not even always necessarily in the context in which the experiment was discussing it, where there's a clear reason to wait, because waiting gets you two marshmallows instead of just getting one now. But even that gets lost in the way that it's translated. Instead, we make people wait for no reason, right? Kids especially, uh, wait for that, just, just wait. Because we think that building that ability to tolerate the delay between wanting a thing and getting a thing somehow makes them better in some way. No evidence to suggest that. How much of your life outside of the specific intentional design of those structures, just in the discourse of our culture, how much of your life, of my life, has been impacted by either you or other people giving you this message that you then learn and internalize and repeat this idea that being impatient is bad, impulsive is bad, patient is good. Well, what does patient mean? You're willing to put up with suffering for longer? And how do we make sure that we don't have an experiment that says waiting for two marshmallows is better than having one right away, which by the way, again, might logically not be true, for example, for a kid who's hungry, even though the assumption from the experimenters part is, well, two is better than one. What if they don't want to? Or what if one now is actually better because I am really hungry than two later when I won't need it, right? <laughs> My next Valentine's card will be, I can't prove that you love me, but evidence points to yes. That is hilarious and also actually a very useful thing for people to do, especially in terms of communication again, Actually, funnily, I was drafting a tweet in my head, as I often do, and rarely actually write and send, making fun of myself and, you know, other people that I know for this, this pattern of, I interact with somebody and it's great and we both enjoy it and we're very clear that we're both friends and we like each other. And then we go away and I don't interact with them for a few days. And now I say, they must hate me. No reasoning behind it, just we haven't talked in a couple of days. The longer we go... It is an entropic, you know, kind of slide. Eventually I will get to, they must hate me by now. But this is actually something that I do both personally and sometimes recommend with clients is, okay, that's your perception and it may or may not be accurate. You don't know, right? That's the whole point. If you knew that it wasn't accurate, it wouldn't bother you. If you knew that it was accurate, it might bother you, but it would bother you in a different way than the one where you're saying, is it, I don't know. So evaluate the evidence that you have. And evidence isn't proof, but every time I text them, they text me back. We hang out every couple of weeks. They did just say they like me. So all the evidence is more supportive of the idea that they do still like me than of the idea that somehow randomly they started hating me in the last two days. So that's one particular study that has caused a lot, a lot of problems because we base so much of what we do with kids in particular around this idea that waiting is better. By the way, obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but I think obviously impactful here in conversations around ADHD and impulsivity. Is it inherently good to be able to have an impulse and delay it independent of any reason to do so? Obviously, if in a specific instance, we can say, well, sure, you have this impulse, but it would be problematic to engage that impulse or act on that impulse in this context. So if you can delay it until you get into this context where it is no longer problematic, or like in the mar marshmallow thing, sure, it would be good to do here, but if you can delay it till here, it'll be even better. But there's so many variables that weigh into all of that, right? That's, that's reasonable. That's understandable, which is part of why this concept resonates. We can all think of examples of times where it was better to wait on something. 
but independent of a reason, there's no reason that you can't do the thing that you're trying to do. A very common example that people probably don't typically think of as being related to this concept is fidgeting for people with ADHD. And of course, you don't have to have an ADHD diagnosis or have ADHD or whatever language you want to use to enjoy fidgeting or everybody fidgets from time to time. The difference in clinical diagnosis is matters of degree and intensity and frequency, not a binary does the thing ever happen or never happen, right? Well, why are we teaching children that it's not okay to fidget? But if you get certain accommodations, then it is okay to fidget. How does that come across the messaging there, right? Because effectively what we're saying is that the act of fidgeting is either in and of itself not a problem, but we just try to get you not to do it anyway. But if you have a good enough reason, we say, okay, fine. Or we're saying that it causes a problem, but that that problem is minor enough or whatever, that it's still okay to let you do it if there's a good enough reason for it, but without messaging any of this to other people. <laughs> no reason I couldn't stay up the entire night reading things I don't really care about does mean I haven't slept though. Yeah, I get what you're going for. And of course, just to clarify for people watching the stream, since I read that out loud, that's a reason, you know, not sleeping and being tired tomorrow is a reason. I'm assuming that's the joke. Um, now I don't even know where to go. Other experiments that are ridiculous. I mean, all of behaviorism, right? Should probably have some impulse interrupters there. Oh boy. I like that. I don't, I'm not familiar with that phrase, impulse interrupter, from before. I'm assuming it's a phrase that's out there, but maybe you just made it up. Um, yeah, sure. I, what I'm constructing in my head to fit that phrase is something that calls your attention to the impulse. Because the thing about impulse and impulse control and delayed gratification, and all of this is that the vast, vast, like orders of magnitude, the vast majority of what we do has no conscious input. It interacts with our consciousness, not at all. We don't consciously intend to do it, decide to do it, decide how to do it, when to do it. We don't consciously notice that we did it or what the impact is. And I know that people might have issue with this. So just let me clarify. I'm talking about literally your heart beating, your breathing, the way that your muscles contract and expand in order to hold this, the balance that you're holding in how you sit and how you lay. Now that I have three minutes left, I want to talk about sleep habits. That's, that is kind of a challenge, and I can try that. Because um, actually that kind of plays into what we're talking about here, that the vast majority of what we're doing is something we never notice. So what do we really mean by impulse? Obviously, the vast, vast majority of what every single person does is done on impulse if what we mean by impulse is like default reaction to a stimuli, right? So what we're doing when we talk about impulse control is first we're saying you've got to identify the impulse consciously before you behave or act on it. You have to determine that that impulse is for some reason problematic or detrimental, or at the at least that it is less beneficial than it could be if done in some other way. And then you have to use that to act on it, right? To, to quash the impulse, to control the impulse, which, you know, again, reasons, but that's step number two. There has to be a reason. Why else would I not do whatever I'm going to do? I will do it impulsively. I'll do it unconsciously, pre-consciously, whatever you want to call it, autonomically. We don't need to think about everything. But if there's something that we're doing that we notice causes problems in some kind of a pattern, then an impulse interrupter, I'm guessing, is something that would bring attention to that when it's happening. So for example, if I bite my nails and it's something that I don't consciously notice or think about or choose to do, but I do later on notice the effects and say, ah, I got to stop that. Then, yeah, if I put something there, say I put a thimble on my thumb, when I go to do it, it'll draw my attention. And now I can consciously decide to take it off and bite it or to leave it on and not bite it, right? That so we're not trying to force you to not engage in the impulse, but we are trying to bring awareness to it. <laughs> uh, and... Ooh, we got to wrap up soon. Uh, okay, you said three minutes, and I talked about another thing. There's two seconds. 
yeah, sleep is a very particularly complicated process. It involves many different systems in the body, organically, biologically, neurologically, shutting down in specific orders related to each other, blah, blah, blah. There's so, so many things that can go wrong with all that. And the vast majority of it is stuff that we are not aware of. So the best thing that I can say generically in just 10 seconds is treat it like an experiment. Come up with your hypothesis, identify the variables, isolate and control as much as you can, and then try it one night one way and the other night the other way. And then listen and follow your results. That if I think I'm not going to sleep at night because of revenge bedtime procrastination, for example, you know, that's a very popular theory out there now for good reason, then okay, let me observe a day where I do feel like I'm doing revenge, you know, like I didn't do much that day and that's why I'm doing revenge bedtime procrastination. And then another day where I did a lot and then let me see what happens there, right? If I think that it's because I ate something at a certain time, let me do a night where I do it and a night where I don't. Of course, small sample size is not as helpful as a larger sample size, so do it as much as you can, that seems worth it. But when you get results that say, hmm, seems like whether I do this or not doesn't really impact it, then let it go. Come up with a new theory and try something else. Identify as much as you can to observe. And some just very quick things that I will say in terms of sleep that are very commonly problematic here is there are way more variables that interact with how you're feeling in terms of tiredness than just the amount of sleep that you get. So oftentimes people will think, if you say, how do you sleep? They'll think of one or two things, uh, one of two things. Either how quickly do I fall asleep, which we call sleep onset, from the time that you start trying to go to sleep until you actually are asleep is the sleep onset, or sleep duration, how much do I sleep? Sometimes people will think about both. But I have literally had conversations with people who are saying, I'm tired. I'm so tired all the time. And I say, how do you sleep? And they say, I sleep great. I fall asleep the second my head hits the pillow. And then I say, well, how much do you sleep? And they say, five hours a night. And then we see there's something worth exploring there potentially. Or they fall asleep great. They sleep eight, nine, ten hours a night. But then it turns out that their sleep quality is terrible. They wake up, like myself, for example, with sleep apnea. Uh, that I just didn't know that was unusual, that I woke up 15 to 20 times a night, only for a few seconds every time to just kind of shift and roll over. I thought that's what sleep was. It's not until I got some context that, you know, that's not what other people were doing. So yeah, delayed sleep onset. Part of it is what time are you trying to sleep? One of the biggest, most problematic conceptions here, widespread concepts here is that sleeping early and waking early is better globally. And that is not the case. We have lots of research that proves this, but we don't even need the research. Not proves it, provides evidence to support it. Uh, we don't even need the research. You have your anecdotal experience. Do you fall asleep? If you go to bed at two o'clock and wake up at 10 o'clock, do you feel good and rested? If you do the same thing from 10 p.m. to, what was that, eight hours? 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., do you feel the same level of, of rested? If the answer is no, you know, keep running the experiment and try and isolate the variables and whatever. But that's there's reason to be aware of or conscious of the idea that you're just going to sleep better for whatever reason from 2 to 10 than from 10 to 6, regardless of other factors. So there isn't a right way, a right time, a right amount of time, a right setup. You just got to experiment. And sleep is a particular one because it is so complicated. <laughs> can't prove being a night owl is real but evidence of my sleep deprivation points yes i have so much more to say about that but we gotta wrap up but yes we have evidence research evidence that points to the idea that being a night owl is a real thing how one becomes one is it static you know not so clear but yeah that people function differently that brain waves look different and blah 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 at different times of day so as a just general way to end all this, I don't even remember where we started now. There is a general sense that the way that we should approach life is that the burden of proof rests on doing what you want, meaning do what you're supposed to do, do what you've been told to do, unless you can justify doing what you want to do, which not only is that ridiculous and not something that we do, it's even if we could do it, a bad way to go about doing it. Instead, it's do whatever the hell you want unless you have a reason not to. And that's not a rare thing at any given moment. Like there are so many things I would want to be doing right now if I had unlimited money, if I had, if COVID weren't real, right? Like there are reasons to do things 
or to not do things that you want all the time, constantly. But the burden of proof is on the reason not to do it. Unless you can find a reason or someone else can justify, give you a reason to not do it, do it. Maybe you'll find out there's a reason. <laughs> Maybe it won't go well and you'll be like, ah, that's why. But still, then you'll know. All right. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you participating in chat there. Uh, fun conversation. I feel like I'm talking 8,000 miles an hour. I appreciate being with you guys. And I will be back next week, Wednesday, 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Central. Bye. I accidentally left the stream instead of closing the stream. So now goodbye.